Tonight, we speak with Academy Award-nominated director Daniel Rame, whose new documentary titled Harold and Lillian, A Hollywood Love Story, premieres on November 17th and 18th at the Doc NYC Fest. Harold and Lillian is the third film in a trilogy of documentaries directed by Mr. Rame, which celebrates the accomplishments of the top craftsmen in classic Hollywood. The first film, titled The Man in Lincoln's Nose, portrayed the life and works of production designer Robert Boyle, who worked on films like North by Northwest and In Cold Blood, The second film, titled Something's Gonna Live, once again delved into the work of Mr. Boyle, as well as cinematographers Conrad Hall and Haskell Wexler, production designers Henry Bumstead and Al Nazaki, and storyboard artist Harold Mickelson. Mr. Mickelson is the focus of this third film as well, alongside his wife Lillian, who made an enormous contribution to the industry as a film researcher. Their story encompasses the greatest films ever made and a rare and loving union that lasted over 50 years. For more information on this beautiful film, visit Daniel Raim, that's R-A-I-M, dot com. I want to know from you your your beginnings, how you kind of ventured into the world of filmmaking to begin with. Okay. (laughs) Um, Let's see. So my my first experience is uh with documentary filmmaking i um in 1994 through 97 was a documentary filmmaker for the israeli defense forces <laughs> that's how the thing that's how my that was where i first got my experience with a with a movie camera wow. uh and i i grew up in the states but um when i was in in high school my my family moved to israel and I had the experience to do that. And, um, and towards the end of my service, I had this kind of like, um, uh, notion that I'm going to come to Hollywood and meet this sage of classic Hollywood filmmaking. Um, and in a, within a month, I met at the American Film Institute, Robert Boyle, production designer of several Alfred Hitchcock classics like North by Northwest and The Birds, Marnie, Shadow of a Doubt, Saboteur. And he was a professor there, and we hit it off immediately. He was a World War II combat cameraman himself, and he was 90 years old at the time. And I'm like, man, this is, this is how, this is, this is where I want to learn about, this is the man <laughs> I want to learn about filmmaking from yeah and that that's a big reason why i i admire what you do so much because i mean these these craftsmen from uh from throughout the history of hollywood i mean they have so much to teach us <laughs> uh yeah. about about movies and uh, not just from a technical standpoint but also just for the masses how to fully appreciate movies um yes. and i find that the the current generation maybe i mean i feel like an old fogey when i say this but maybe they don't they aren't as engaged in knowing uh in learning from from the classics as much as they should be so i think that's another reason why yeah. this, your films are so valuable thank you um you know when i was at afi and we had the you know uh robert boyle who was the head of the production design program um you know i could feel that there was you know, in his, and when he would talk about story, you know, filmmaking, it was less about craft and technique and more about storytelling. And mm. um, and uh, and what it means to be an artist, you know, and a communicator. And um, you could feel, you know, through his ta- you know conversations with the class that you know the way he approached filmmaking, the way he approached, you know, the sitting in a room with Hitchcock was less about, less concerned with, uh, you know, making sets that looked, I guess, real versus, you know, telling a story. I don't know if that, if, you know, there's, we can dig deeper into that, but, uh, but also speaking to what you said, it felt to me that, you know, there were some, 
some of us that were enthralled <laughs> by listening to to their war stories and 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 specifically their approach to to filmmaking and and at on some level there was also a disconnect too so for me so making these films felt like addressing that disconnect absolutely and and another element of that is i mean we're, we're talking about the greatest production designers, the the greatest storyboard artists and cinematographers in the history of the industry, uh, mm. and those are positions that, uh, for the most part, people aren't very familiar with the the mechanics of. Uh, Correct. What led you to be uh, so intensely interested in the kind of be, the behind the scenes, the 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 jobs that mm. are really in the spotlight as much? Yeah. It's a great question. I think what drew me first and foremost to telling, the, the, making this, I would let's say we can call it like a trilogy of documentaries, like three with the, with Harold and Lily and a Hollywood love story being the, the final leg in this trilogy. Uh, it started with the man on Lincoln's nose. Uh, and uh, I guess I started filming that when I was at the AFI. I was so I was personally so enthralled by listening by when when I was in those classes with Robert Boyle, who's 90, and then he brings in Harold Michelson for a conversation, and he brings in Henry Bumstead for a conversation, mm-hmm. or he brings in, you know, and we're, or we're talking with cinematographers of that generation. I was sitting there and went, man, somebody needs to be rolling the camera. I mean, these not only are these stories amazing, but these pers- these people are amazing too. Like this is mm-hmm. like of a time, right? These are. You know their their enthusiasm and their passion, but they're like, it, you know, it it just it. So I'm not only drawn to the kind of films they made, you know, classic Hollywood golden age cinema. I mean, but also to them as as human beings. And I thought that my my interest was to 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 to, div- to create these films, devise these films as um, portraits of them as people, as well as these classic, you know, as well as the work they did. And what did you find in, you know, all, all of these figures that you've profiled mm-hmm. uh, in their attitude towards the work and, and kind of towards the notion of, of being an artist? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that the, that their attitude is one of, you know, I think from in something's going to live Haskell Wexler says, you know, we're, we're towards the end of the film. He sort of summarizes it. I had to put it in the movie. Cause it's so nice because he says, you know, we're, I don't want uh, people to think that we're a bunch of old farts sitting here complaining how, because you know, how great it used to be because mm-hmm. it was never great. What was great was us trying to make it great, you know, and that's, I think, a really kind of sum, summarizes that all these people working behind the scenes, the, 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 you know, storyboard artists and cinematographers. I mean, Harold Michelson, you know, said, I did some of my best work on movies that were complete flops, you know, like, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. you know, they, yeah, it, it, they, there was a, there was a, um, a, uh, a drive maybe you know to to tell a story to to and a drive to make it cinematic you know and i think a lot of the you know i think a lot of the f- people have focused on worked on you know with a lot of them worked with alfred hitchcock and there was a certain um kind of uh reverence for him and 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 what they gained or learned from him is interesting to me too and how that sort of influenced them over the, you know, throughout working on on pictures, you know, beyond his, his, working with Hitchcock, but what they learned from him, the master of cinema, basically, right, um, is really interesting. And um, and there's so much philosophy that goes into their storytelling. Um, and in this last film, I had the honor of interviewing Rick Carter, who's you know one of the great modern production designers and has designed everything from like all the Spielberg films, uh, including back to the future and the most recent star Wars, but he got his start. And so did Jim Bissell, uh, production designer of ET and most recent the last like two Brad bird films. 
and all the George Clooney doc films. But they're they're they kind of con- they're working to continue that legacy that they learn from from people like Robert Boyle and Henry Bumstead. You know, we just uh, spent yeah. uh, we just uh, did a, an hour and a half interview with Haskell Wexler for one of our uh, shows the past mm-hmm. month or so. And uh, you know it's so refreshing when you when you speak to these people, many of whom you have spoken to, uh, mm-hmm. that they're that they're kind of uh, they can't help but be truthful. I mean, there's no yeah. there's no filter. You get a very clear eyed view of what Hollywood was like during the time that they functioned. That's right. That's true. Um, Conrad Hall. Uh, you know, when, when I met him and interviewed him and, and, and he'd always speak of the, you know, the idea of truth, you know, I'm after some kind of truth, you know, that's not something you hear every day today, really, you know, it's like, what is truth? And when I was filming him at the time that I was in film school, you know, I was making this documentary independent of the, being in film school, but I, I, um, the time that kind of word kind of went over my head what does that mean capturing truth you know and that that i guess you know to summarize it now i mean how many years later is sort of the essence of cinema mm-hmm. and um and um and to that you know just kind of continuing that thought on conrad hall sort of the process or uh, jumping around in topics here but my process in making these films was that when you know Conrad Hall passed away, I think in 2005, I believe. Yeah. Um, when I had filmed him in 2000, and I called him to let him know that, you know, I'm really sorry, but, um, you know, the footage we shot with you and we 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 did several things together, is not going to be in this new film, The Man on Lincoln's Nose, and. And he did, he he expressed to me his um, disappointment. He's like, I'm really I'm totally disappointed. I thought we said some really important things. And I was um, what 22 years old, and I'm like, man, that's a bummer, you know. And <laughs> about four years later, um, I wasn't even thinking about making a follow up, uh, but I was looking at that archive footage that I filmed with Conrad Hall and Haskell Wexler. And others, and I thought, man, there's a, there is a story here, and they do have something important to say. Um, and that's when I started making the follow-up, something that's going to live, and mm-hmm. to to bring to life those moments, you know, and those ideas that they wanted to pass on. And and I also realized, well, I'm making a film, I'm not filming a lecture, and so that became the I think the greatest challenge in the second feature was to to create a documentary that was, you know, emotional, moving, and entertaining as well as informative. And when you get, you know, Haskell Wexler in front of a camera and Conrad <laughs> Hall and others, they're going to say some really amazing things. But to sort of wrap it into a a, a moving story was was the challenge. Well, also a big part of uh, of your films uh, is the inclusion of of other films throughout mm-hmm. history. Sure, uh, some of the yeah. greatest films ever made. Uh, in the editing room, is that a particular challenge to to pull to just the right moments from these films? That's a great question. I think that in in the second feature, something's going to live. Part of our process in the edit, editing room was to um, watch all these films um, with my co-editor, my wife, Jennifer Rehm, and uh, we would look at all these films and extract moments that were meaningful both to the work that they, you know, to their contributions that illustrated their, you know, you know, their artistic and technical contributions, but scenes within those films that were also meaningful to the ideas that they were trying to convey as storytellers too. So Mm -hmm. there was trying to intertwine poetically, if you will, the, the, the essence of what our subjects are talking about in terms of what they're striving to do as, you know, storytellers 
and um, and and the and those moments in the films that depict that. Yeah, and you mentioned Hitchcock, and this is this is a figure that uh, that is pr- pretty prominent throughout these these three films, and and right. it's a collaborator they all seem to have in common. Collectively, yeah. when you take their impressions collectively of Hitchcock, what what do you come away with? What was unique about his particular working methods? Yeah, great question. Number one, he over and over again, I hear that he was incredibly collaborative, mm. and that was a big part of his his working methods. In that, long before a script is written, he would his team, his entire team, and I hear this is not something that's common at all today, but he in his bungalow at Universal, and in his office, you could find a round table with his entire team, his DP, Robert Burks, his production designer, Robert Boyle, his editor, George Tomasini, who's on hand, his whatever scriptwriter he's working with. Harold Michelson, his storyboard artist, would be there. You know, his secretary, you know, they're all there and they're all talking through the story. Mm-hmm. And and he would be long before the script was written, kind of sharing ideas he has for images, you know, sequences. I think he would just talk out certain sequences and everyone would, you know, be making notes. Harold would make thumbnail sketches. Robert Boyle would be going through the history of art, you know, contemplating what, you know, is it Munch's scream that evokes the ideas and feelings? It's all emotion, you know. That's really what's so interesting is that in the end of the day, they're, depicting emotion through visual through visualization and mm-hmm. it's interesting that that team would be you know long before a, a script is written we're just in the early, at the initial stages of developing the structure now did i answer your question too because i kind of went off here but you're no what, no, no was, you yeah, you yeah. absolutely did i i mean i was i was uh, I, I was interested in what the perception was of hitchcock and what the reality was perception, as, as sure. told to you from from these great yeah. people. Another um, story Hitchcock related uh, that I think really interesting is that if he could get 50%, this was sort of his ideal, but if he could get 50% of what he wanted to convey emotionally on the screen, he was happy. And that, that's, that, that was a kind of a driving philosophy that I understood. Um, he was anyhow. That, we could go much deeper into that, but please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the Hitchcock is an endless well. Uh, so your your newest film, Harold and Lillian, uh, mm-hmm. it's beautiful. And what's particularly striking about this one? I mean, again, it's a terrific tribute to Hollywood craftsmanship and Hollywood artistry and the great movies that have informed it. But uh, it's also a love story, as as said in the subtitle of your film, Hollywood Love Story. Um, Was that a delicate balance to do justice to those two strands? It was. Um, Thank you, by the way. Um, It absolutely presented a challenge in the, you know, oftentimes you you hear uh, in terms of like, you know, doing a biographical documentary or biopic uh, you know, careful from the cradle to the grave structure, you know, beware of that. But in this case, I felt that in the, my initial intention was to, in the course of this feature, convey a life lived, you know, how they, you know, basically the scope of their life together. And the, the, that was both a profoundly creative and a profoundly loving partnership. And, and, and looking at how those, their life, which was in, in so many respects, kind of like, uh, you know, their work and their family life all was, was, was so intertwined. And, and that's, I think that was the story that I wanted to tell. Yeah. And tell me about Lillian, because, uh, Mm-hmm. I mean, you just absolutely fall in love with her watching mm-hmm. your movie. Uh, and she was a big pioneer in film research, which I don't think many people consider when they see 
when they watch any film right. has that kind of that kind of aspect of work that goes into creating that reality. T- tell me yeah. about her contributions to film. No um, pleasure. That's right. No, nobody really, including myself, really think about what a film researcher brings to a to a film. And in that small community of film researchers and production designers and screenwriters and directors uh, of Hollywood, basically from the 60s through today, Lillian is regarded as the kind of dean of motion picture research. And she's earned that reputation um, by in two ways. One, having this fantastic research library that she's held together. Uh, she bought it in 1969 from Samuel Goldwyn, uh, where it was from the 30s until she bought it, the Samuel Goldwyn Research Library. And she brought that, basically that library survived through Lillian. Uh, They were basically going to donate it. Now, libraries were considered the nerve center of Hollywood studios. Every studio had a research library, and that's where writers and designers and directors would come in for inspiration. And it was like a, a hub of, 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 of basically a place where people, you could just, it's kind of like pre-internet and you go to, and you pull out a book and you're thinking about something or you have a ton of questions. So you go to the researcher. Now someone like Lillian had relationships with acquaintances with, with, with people on all sides of the law. I mean, so she could get information from, Drug lords, the CIA, you name it. You know, Jewish, you know, Jewish ladies on a on a, on Fairfax, you know, bus stop. If she needs to do some research from Fiddler on the Roof, she would. Her tenacity and her ability to get information, even the hardest, you know, the information you'd think would be impossible to find. What does the inside of a Chinese prison look like? You know. What is, how do you build a bomb? You know, what, anything, you know, what does a cocaine laboratory, you know, she would have relationships and, and, um, and be able to provide the, um, the filmmakers with that information. And oftentimes it would have an impact on the, the narrative and the storytelling and ultimately the authenticity of a film. I think that's an important word too. Yeah. Yeah. And that is one of the most delightful parts of your film, where she tells the story of the uh, the Bolivian drug dealer <laughs> yeah. that offered to, <laughs> offered to take her to his operations in Bolivia, and, and she was so excited. And her husband said, "What are you crazy? You're not going to yeah. do that." <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, there's there's uh, it's relationships are hard, marriages are hard, many of them don't last, and and you hear that especially if both partners are kind of working in the same industry, it can be a difficult uh, road. What do you attribute their successful marriage to? Because it's lasted what well over yeah. 50 years, right? Yeah, I think it's attributed to Harold's character, you know, that really comes through. And the fact that he wasn't uh, you know, I had done several interviews with him, but I never, because he had passed away in 2007, and I made, started making this film in 2013, there's a gaping hole. I wasn't able to, to um, in, you know, talk with him about his, his, that aspect of the story. And fortunately, right. I'd, I, had some, I had some footage, and I had asked him some questions about how he met Lillian, and that was really nice. But as a result, Lillian, I asked Lillian's permission to, to use some of the, le- the letters he wrote to her to... to to bring his, you know, his yeah. voice into the film, and man, you know, the, again, talk about, a, a, you know, people from another time, and his, lo- I mean, his love for her was incredible, and their love for each other, and another important note is that they were collaborators too, and you know, he was a rising star in the studio system as a, as a storyboard artist. He was working already on the Ten Commandments and um, dozens of films. And and then Lillian decided, you know, who she was like a, a brilliant woman and decided, I'm not going to just sit around and as a housewife, I want to be helpful. I want to do something. And so she was became a, 
a volunteer at the library, at the research library, across the hall from where Harold was working at the Samuel Golden Studios when he was working on West Side Story. And so suddenly she becomes an important part of, you know, his process and, and, uh, and, um, and so they built a life together that was both creative and loving. Yeah. And you feel that. I mean, you, you, f- you feel that intensity of affection they had for each other, uh, yeah. in the film. Now this, your, your movie, uh, it's about to play at the, the, the doc, uh, NYC fest, mm-hmm. but you premiered, uh, at Cannes earlier Correct. this year, didn't you? What was yes. that, uh, what was the Cannes experience like for you? Well, it was, it was fantastic. I mean, it's just the, 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 you know, premiering the documentary at the, the Cannes Film Festival and, you know, where I knew, you know, I knew that we were, go- we're, we're in the right place because this is, you yes. know, the cinephile, you know, heaven here. And, um, so that was really special bringing it there and, 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 and launching it on that, in that festival it was truly, truly remarkable. I'm always curious about this uh, when it comes to documentary filmmaking. Your um, your feeling of responsibility towards the subjects that you're making a film on. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me how that weighs on you. What their opinion of mm-hmm. the final product? What what kind of role that plays in your yeah. in your work? That whole dynamic. Yeah. You know, I mean, on one hand, it's it's I can. I can liken it to the idea that a, a painter, you know, goes to his next door neighbor, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like the impressionists, right? You know, they, they painted their friends and, uh, in a way I become friends with them and I want to do a portrait and I hope mm-hmm. they like it. Um, and, um, but absolutely, I think there is a tremendous responsibility, uh, and you know with that comes a certain amount of fear i guess like that wow you're 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 you know you're you're telling somebody's life story and it's not a book it's a visual medium and and has to work as a film and 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 um and for me i'm so interested in their personalities and in the small moments in their life too that uh i hope i hope these films do justice well, I absolutely think that they do. But, I mean, that has to be a particular challenge because I, I completely understand the fear involved mm-hmm. in that. But at the same time, you have to feel free enough to present your own impression of, of them. Correct. Yeah, precisely. That's right. That's right. I mean, I'm really thinking back to when I was 22, and I'm sitting in Robert Boyle's class at AFI Conservatory, and it, I, and it's like dawns on me, I want to make a movie about this guy. And I'd never made a movie about anyone. And I was, that's, that's, you know, and every initial stage of every documentary, I go through a similar experience, but I was overcome with this feeling of like, all right, who am I to tell this guy's story? I mean, you know, and, um, and you kind of have to overcome that. And, um, yeah. 